ornate mathematical patterns, lavish design, exquisite detail. Nature surpasses even the most talented artists in her extravagant beauty, richness and deep order. Her forms are marked by an overabundance that cannot be reduced to mere utility. But can such order and beauty be explained by Darwinian evolution? And if it can't, what does that mean for our understanding of nature? Opulent architecture. Intricate fugues and symphonies. Dramatic art. The Baroque era, spanning the 17th century and half of the 18th century, was so characterized by florid excess that the word came to be synonymous with extravagance. Pure functionality faded to the background and layers of gratuitous beauty and stunningly detailed design defined music, art and architecture. The great architects of the period didn't just build with their sites focused on function. The designers of Versailles or St. Paul's Cathedral were aiming to create something beautiful, something sublime. The opposite approach is to create structures that are purely functional, with no emphasis on beauty or taste. The German Bauhaus movement and its modernist architecture is one example. Industrial design is another. So is life under Darwinian evolution. Darwinism is, at its core, a profoundly functional mechanism. Natural selection ruthlessly eliminates from the gene pool any organism whose structures aren't useful for survival and reproduction. If a new structure is to be passed on to offspring, according to strict Darwinian theory, it must serve some new adaptive function. That is, it must be useful for survival. In the Darwinian view, beauty is at best an unintended side product, a mere whim of sexual selection. Nothing need be decorative, everything has a specific use, or it is discarded. Under Darwinism, nature is strictly utilitarian. For more than a century, biology has been understood in these terms. But what if this way of looking at life has blinded us to the true nature of biology? What if there are other factors at play? Geneticist Michael Denton began to wonder about the standard Darwinian explanation of nature while studying the red blood cell for his PhD at King's College in London. As he came across features in biology that did not seem to possess any particular survival benefit, Denton began to realize just how much order in biology was actually non-adaptive. He started seeing life more as a piece of Baroque artwork than as a purely functional machine. Non-adaptive order is seen in something like a maple leaf or leaf forms, where you have extraordinarily complex and beautiful patterns for which you can't imagine what function that pattern, specific function, the pattern serves. So that's what non-adaptive order is. Um, it's, it's, it's a pattern in the natural world for which you can't imagine what function it served. And that's a fantastically serious challenge to Darwinism. Imagine stepping outside on a sunny summer's day. All around you are different kinds of trees, each displaying beautiful order in their differently shaped leaves. But for Darwinian evolution to explain the shape of these leaves, or any structure in a living organism, there ought to be some reason why that specific shape caused one organism to live and another to die in a given environment. Yet there appears to be no functional reason why there are so many different leaf shapes. Much like Baroque architecture, these shapes seem extra, perhaps even decorative. They're not needed to survive. They are simply beautiful.
So okay, if it's just a maple leaf, you can perhaps pass over the maple leaf. But if non-adaptive order, like the maple leaf, uh, permeates the biological world, and if a lot of the taxa-defining novelties seem to be non-adaptive, you now have a nightmarish scenario <laughs> when the fundamental assumption of Darwinism is that all the novelties in nature are adaptive suddenly looks very insecure. The examples of non-adaptive order fill the world of botany and plant life. You can look at the beautiful concentric pattern underlying angiosperm flowers. That's all flowers belong to the group called angiosperms. The basic plan of the flower is concentric circles. You have an outer circle of sepals, then you have an inner circle of petals, then you have stamens, and you have the carpel in the middle. All flowers are built on this beautiful concentric plan. But what organism was that concentric plan adaptive in? What function did that pattern of gene expression originally serve? It's exceedingly difficult to give an adaptive framework to explain that particular pattern. And if you can't show that it's adaptive, then you can't give, you can't give a Darwinian explanation for it. The abstract patterns underlying organic structures may be easier to recognize in plant life, but examples abound in the animal world as well. Many structures that seem primarily functional have at their base underlying plans that are not particular to certain environments. Oftentimes, these take the form of numeric patterns or constraints. Many of the characteristics that divide the different taxa from each other, the characteristics that are used to define the branches on the tree of life, seem to be abstract and non-adaptive. One of the most familiar patterns in animals is the insect body plan. The plan divides an insect into three parts. The head, a thorax with six legs, each divided into five basic parts, and an abdomen. Every insect is based on this plan. Many very different adaptive structures are built on top of this pattern, from the grasshopper's legs for leaping to a bee's legs for gathering pollen. But these adaptations are only skin deep, built upon a more fundamental, unchanging pattern that crosses species, environments and functions. Much like Bach's fugues, all these variations among insects are variations on a common theme. It's apparent that these variations are adaptive. But what was the original survival value of the underlying theme, the insect body plan itself? Denton's answer is that perhaps the underlying theme or body plan never was adaptive. Or perhaps it was only adaptive in a generic sense. It might have been a good ground plan to build different insect species, but even if it was a good ground plan, this would still be a paradox for Darwinism, because natural selection cannot see or select for features that merely have an underlying general usefulness. Natural selection is limited to selecting structures that are adaptive, that serve some specific purpose in a specific species and environment. The pentadactyl limb is another example of a generically adaptive structure that is hard to account for by natural selection. The pentadactyl limb is the pattern of one bone, two bones, and five digits that underlies the limbs of all terrestrial vertebrates. This pattern applies both across species and within the same species. Limbs obviously have functional purposes. But much like the insect body plan, it isn't clear why all tetrapod limbs are built on the same pattern when they serve wildly different functions. Even Darwin thought it strange. What can be more curious, he wrote, than that the hand of a man formed for grasping, that of a mole for digging, the leg of a horse, the paddle of the porpoise and the wing of the bat should all be constructed on the same pattern. Darwin shrugged off the mystery as a consequence of common descent. In Darwin's view, a biological feature shared by different organisms today could have come from a common ancestor. 
But descent from a common ancestor only explains how a feature, once developed, is passed down to other organisms. It doesn't explain how the feature itself arose in the first place, so it really doesn't solve the mystery of non-adaptive forms shared across species. Even less does common descent explain the existence of non-adaptive patterns in individual species. For example, the hind and forelimbs of all terrestrial vertebrates are built on the same underlying pentadactyl pattern, even though they take different forms and perform radically different functions. Consider your own limbs. The human hand is made for holding and grasping and equipped with fine motor skills. The human foot, on the other hand, is made for running and walking. Yet these two structures with completely different functions are built on the same pentadactyl plan. And this holds true for every terrestrial vertebrate species. How can the similarity between the two be accounted for in purely adaptive terms? Other examples of apparently non-adaptive patterns abound among animals. Why do centipedes always have an odd number of body segments? How did that help them survive? Why do nearly all mammals, from mice to giraffes, have seven bones in their cervical vertebrae? All octopi have eight tentacles. Why not six or ten? Jellyfish have a mesmerizing radial symmetry. Sand dollars and starfish both display a star-like pattern. Nature seems to have plenty of room to develop order and patterns that do not serve an immediate survival purpose. Darwinism, however, is not that flexible. It's not enough, according to Darwinian theory, that a biological feature is currently adaptive. Every stage in its past evolution also had to be adaptive. And in the case of many biological features, that seems far from likely. Denton's own area of study, the red blood cell in mammals, is a stark example. Unlike red blood cells in all other animals, the red blood cell in mammals is enucleated, ejecting its nucleus before entering the bloodstream. Enucleation takes place two million times per second in the average human adult, and it involves an elaborate and highly choreographed biological process where the entire cytoplasmic machinery of the cell is reorganized in order to achieve the end result. It's unclear whether the enucleated red blood cell is actually adaptive in a Darwinian sense. Other animals with a high need for oxygen get by perfectly well by keeping the nucleus in their red blood cells. But even if the enucleated red cell is adaptive, that doesn't mean a Darwinian process can account for its development. That's because it's very difficult to envisage a series of adaptive transitional forms leading from a red blood cell with a nucleus to a red blood cell without a nucleus. According to Denton, such transitional cells are completely unknown in nature. Moreover, even if a transitional red blood cell could somehow survive with a nucleus partway outside the cell, that trait would almost certainly be maladaptive and thus eliminated by natural selection. Such transitional forms would be evolutionary dead ends, not stepping stones on the way to the enucleated red blood cell. The lack of adaptive transitional forms poses a critical problem for Darwinian explanations of not only the enucleated red cell, but many other biological features as well. An additional challenge to Darwinian explanations comes from biological features that may be adaptive but they appear to be far beyond what is needed for mere survival. Perhaps one of the most extravagant of these biological features is one we usually take completely for granted. The level to which it has developed is so excessive it is beyond a utilitarian explanation. You are experiencing this amazing biological feature at this very moment. It's our cognitive and higher mental abilities, especially language. Language is a characteristic that defines us as a species. But as a biological development, it is completely unparalleled. While Darwinian conjectures have been proposed to explain how grunts and hand signals could have developed into speech, none of them have any real empirical evidence. 
and the sheer distance between the grunts, howls, barks and bleats of animals and human language as we know it is astronomical, if they can be fairly compared at all. Human language is so complex and nuanced that it has become impossible to simulate perfectly in even the most advanced intelligent machines, as any simple conversation with Siri will show. Human language is varied and textured, adapted to both concrete and abstract conversation across every people, group and culture. What makes human language so intriguing is not just the great variety of different languages, but their underlying similarities. Despite superficial differences, human languages share deep structural similarities. This is why an Australian Aborigine can learn German, despite the many differences between German and the languages of the Australian Aborigines. The fact that humans, no matter what part of the world they're from, share both language and equivalent higher intellectual faculties means that these abilities must have arisen in the earliest human ancestor, and that poses a problem. The capability to compose a symphony, understand advanced mathematics or discuss abstract ideas would not have been of any survival value for early man. His needs were shelter and food. The idea primitive man needed our current linguistic or other higher intellectual abilities to survive is untenable. Nevertheless, early man must have had this capability because it was passed down to every human in every part of the world. Even today, things like art, literature or music are understood to be valuable not for survival or reproduction, but for their own sake. Such capacities reach far beyond the algorithm of natural selection. They're excessive, superfluous, even a gift. Their very existence is completely incomprehensible if humans are solely the result of Darwinian forces. The case that human language developed step by step through natural selection is further weakened by the fact that no single language gene has ever been discovered. That is, the needed complexities seem to have arisen spontaneously in a self-organizing, emergent fashion. Non-adaptive and beyond adaptive order poses an existential challenge to Darwinism because it means there are huge parts of the history of life that not only can't be explained by Darwinian evolution but they are completely outside the domain of natural selection. Natural selection only selects for adaptation. If non-adaptive order exists, Darwinism cannot be the whole story of life. If nature is an artist, not just an engineer, Darwinism is in a dire position. For a designer, lots of patterns might exist in nature, which have, as it were, are deeply adaptive, but um, not adaptive for a specific organism. On the other hand, the designer might decide that he likes this pattern. He likes the pattern of a maple leaf, or you know, it's beautiful, or it's uh, symmetrical, or something like this. In other words, on a, on a design hypothesis, um, uh, you don't need to show that all the order of the biology of the world is specifically adapted in a specific organism. Intelligent design leaves room for nature's peculiarities and novelties because it acknowledges that there are some things that are irreducible to mere adaptation and survival. There are other forces at work in nature besides that of natural selection and death. If you imagine there's a designer behind the world, the designer will be free to choose whichever patterns he wants. But I think that non-adaptive order poses a far less of a challenge to intelligent design theories than it does to Darwinism. Because Darwinism necessitates that all the order of nature is adaptive or once was adaptive. And if you can't show that, Darwinism can't be shown to be the engine of evolution.